Hey, CC Online family, wasn't that a powerful testimony of the faithfulness of God? I would like to add that the day of their wedding, they had an unexpected guest bring a large sum of money that went forward to offset even more costs and provide for a grand future in their marriage. And so, wow, they were still reaping a harvest even after that harvest they experienced from the seed they sown. Powerful story, and God wants to do the same with you and I. Well, I like to pray before I teach, so would you join me in that place as I pray over today's word? And so, Lord, I thank you for the privilege it is to share with people you love deeply. I ask that these words go forth to impact every viewer with the truth that you desire to bring to light to them today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as many of you may or may not know, last week we launched a series entitled Next Year's Harvest. And the series highlights the truth of sowing and reaping that we find in Scripture. One of the things I appreciate about Pastor David's uh, points that he brought up from last week, our lead pastor, is this, as we launch the series, that he's in attention. That he's in attention when it comes to talking about sowing a financial seed because of the time we're in with COVID where some are experiencing great loss while others are experiencing great gain. And I appreciate the fact that he reminded us that planting is a choice. It's an opportunity and planting requires faith. And so I just want to add to this conversation with the second installment today that's entitled The Law of the Harvest. The Law of the Harvest. You see, in Scripture, it's extremely clear that God promises a harvest. A harvest represents a return for your labor when that seed matures and it grows into something greater than that's a return. That's your harvest. And I'm going to unpack Galatians 6, 7 through 10. And in Galatians 6, the Apostle Paul, the original author, when you look at his original audience, he is making the case, he's making a strong argument and a case for the centrality of the gospel message. He's saying it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and nothing else, that you can't add anything else to this gospel to make it more potent or make it more effective. It's the gospel plus Nothing. And in this book, while he's bringing this truth to light, he closes Galatians with this truth on the law of the harvest or the law of great returns. Some people call it that because, in essence, you can't separate the practice of sowing and reaping from the gospel. And he's making this incredible case now in Galatians 6, 7 through 10. Let me read it, and then let's pull out the nutrients that's right here in the text. It says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Powerful truth that he brings to light. He's saying, listen, God can't be mocked. 
We're all going to reap a harvest to some degree, a good or a bad harvest. And then he unpacks that, listen, there are seeds. And you may say, well, what are the seeds that we sow? What does that mean? Let me give you a few. The seeds that we plant are your thoughts. It could be your thought, your thought life, your self-talk, your labeling, what you think about yourself. Your thoughts are powerful. And what we meditate on is potent. And it brings about a harvest. Your seeds are your words. Your words, uh, the power of the tongue. You could uh, speak life or confession. And let me be clear, when I say speak life, I'm not talking the same as creatorial life like you see in Genesis when God spoke the world into existence. But there is power in the confession when we confess the word over our lives. In fact, I love the way my dad used to tell me this old Southern kind of sta statement they used to say to really get this, watching your words. He said, Lionel, always remember this. Keep your words short and sweet. You never know which ones you have to eat. And it would always remind me of that because why? Your words have power. What else are your seeds? It's your actions. It's good behavior, good decisions, or bad decisions. So we all have seeds along the way. Now, what is the law of the harvest? The question, the first law is this. You reap what you sow. Galatians 6, 7 makes it extremely clear. We don't have to guess. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And when it says God can't be mocked, in essence... He's saying, you can't say you believe the gospel. You can't say you believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and your actions when you sow into the flesh or you sow into the spirit. Your actions can't go perpendicular to your theological belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So my actions must prove what I believe. And so I pose this question to you. Would they know you're a Christian, or I'm a Christian, if we didn't talk, but only went by our actions. Do my actions speak to the truth of the gospel that I believe in? And that's what he's saying. God can't be mocked. Listen, a, a seed won't remain a seed forever. When it germinates, it's going to grow into something. And we're always planting along the way. I'm reminded of a story of three thieves. Those thieves were being slick. And they robbed this rich man of all his valuable goods and they brought his money and his goods to the forest and ran there, those three thieves. And they were in the forest so long, trying to hide until things died down for their search. And one of them said, hey, we've been here for a while. I know we're all getting kind of hungry. I'm going to go into town and bring us back some food so we at least can be full while we wait in the forest. One of those individuals went out and he went to town to go buy some food. Then he had this evil thought and he was concocting an evil deed. He said, you know what? I would love to have all those goods and that money to myself. When I eat at this restaurant, I'm going to bring back the food for them, but I'm going to put a deadly poison in that food. So as soon as they eat it, those guys drop dead right away. Meanwhile, while he was devising that plan, the two thieves in the forest had their own plan. The two thieves said, you know what? It would be much better if we could split these spoils between just the two of us and we didn't have to include the third guy. So, you know, as soon as he comes back into the forest, let's hit him and take care of him and take him out. They had that plan. So they all lived out the evil deed they wanted to do. Once he came back to bring the food to the gentleman, that poisoned food, as soon as they saw him on sight, boom, they hit him. He dropped to the floor. They killed him right there. And they were like, "Woo! we took care of him and wait, went and ate the food. <laughs> and they all reaped the harvest <laughs> that they all were going to get. They didn't live happily ever after. They died happily 
ever after. The, the reality is that what I'm saying is we're all planting seeds, whether good seeds or bad seeds, and seeds that will reap a harvest. So we need to be very intentional to say, hey, what am I planting by the seeds I sow? If I sow hard work, well, I, I would reap a, a success and labor. If I sow finances, I reap provision. I can't sow corn seeds and expect potatoes. Instead, we reap what we sow. And he's setting the foundation to let them know this truth of the gospel and then we move to the second law here and it's this you prepare before you sow there's a preparation that takes place the apostle Paul in another portion of scripture he brings that preparation he brings light into that in Corinthians he puts it like this in 2 Corinthians 9 6, 6, 6 and 7 remember this Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. What he's saying, church, is we must prepare the heart. And reluctance and compulsion speaks of either fear or anxiety. And he's saying, don't be that person that's just reluctant or thinking, God, would you really take care of me if I sow? Would you really take care of me if I sow generously? He's saying, hey, listen, you don't have to be flippant. You don't have to be quick. You can be very pensive about it. You could think about it and prepare properly in your heart and prepare properly in your mind to think through the implications of your seed that you could also believe God. You see, one of the traps we can fall into is that when we read the supernatural cases in scripture, and yes, scripture speaks of the supernatural. Scripture speaks of the miraculous. Uh, it does. It's very clear. But we often, we, we look to the miraculous sometimes in in lieu of the practical steps it takes to sow a seed, we'll think, hey, you know, God's just miraculously going to provide for me. He's going to miraculously do what I need him to do. And listen, I'm not hindering the divine intervention of God. Yes, he can. But he also gives us wisdom, like you see right here in this scripture, to think rationally. Why? We don't live in a magic kingdom. We live in the kingdom of God. And this is how he's ordained for us to reap a harvest. Harvest. There's practical aspects. And so that means I'm intentional about budgeting when it comes to sowing a seed. I'm intentional about plugging up the holes in my life if I'm living way above my means. That means I'm intentional about, intentional about securing seed to say, God, I want to use this seed to sow towards your kingdom. I remember learning this lesson, not from some seasoned saint that's been walking with the Lord for years, and that's great. I learned this lesson right in front of me with a 16 year old when I was a teen director a 16 year old that had been saved maybe a little less than a year I provided an opportunity for the teens to give and I said hey we're going to take care of some, uh, some orphans in another country we're going to sow so that they can have provision with school supplies and sneakers and so I challenged them to do so it was this 16 year old teen I'll call him Joe. Joe came up to me. He said, Pastor Lionel, I don't have a lot of seed myself, so this is what I've decided to do. He said, I'm going to pick up some extra hours on my job. Notice what he did. He said, I'm not going to wait till some seeds fell on my lap. I'm not going to wait till some seed just, I, I just concocted some seed out my mind. He said, I'm going to pick up extra hours on my job. And with those extra hours of income, I want to use that seed to bless the less fortunate that we're going to sow into. And it was right there that it dawned on me that this 16 year old saw the significance of saying, Lord, use my preparation, use my labor so I can plant a seed for others to receive. And so it takes intentionality. We prepare our minds. We prepare our budgets. We prepare our finances. On December 12th and 13th, as a church, as a team, as a body, we're challenging one another to say, hey, will you consider a significant, generous gift towards the work of the Lord here at Christ Church? 
And as my wife and I have been in dialogue about, hey, what are we going to give? What are we going to sow towards the work of the Lord? One of the things that are, is very practical that we did, we know Christmas is coming up. And can I say Christmas is the, the, the great debt begetter if we're not careful? We listed each person we desire to give a gift to, and we put a financial price tag next to it to say we won't go past this. Why? Because we want also a seed to go towards the work of the Lord. We must prepare before we sow. It can't be flippant. It can't be reluctant. And I wonder what it is. Maybe God is prompting your heart. Maybe God is, 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 is strengthening your faith to say, you know what? I want to sow a seed on the 12th and 13th. And maybe you can be very intentional to say, hey, we usually go out to eat on such and such day. Let's not go out to eat. Let's save that money for this seed. Hey, we usually experience this luxury. Let's cancel this luxury or whatever that thing is and say, let's use that seed in order to go towards the work of the Lord. And so there's a clear principle in the law of the harvest that we reap what we sow and we prepare before we sow. It takes preparation. It's not a magic kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. Law number three puts it like this. You reap later than you sow. Galatians 6, 9 introduces that hard truth. I wish it was up to me when I receive what I get from the Lord. I wish it was up to me. I'm, a, I'm, I'm part of the microwave generation. I want it now. I want it quick. So waiting on that, that wait time could be tough. But Galatians 6, 9 puts it like this. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, at the proper time, you can say it with me. Right now, if you're, if you're watching at home, you could put a, a time clock emoji or something, a thumbs up. If you know what I'm talking about, at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. There's always that time between when you sow and when the harvest comes. Even in the natural, with the pregnancy, the average pregnancy lasts from 37 to 40 weeks. There is a time of, uh, of uh, in between where that baby is being formed and then the harvest comes. They look, scientists also, they looked at elephants. And by the way, uh, uh, ladies that are watching right now, an uh, elephant's time of, of, of having that child in the womb could be 22 months. Did you hear what I said? Imagine being pregnant for two years straight, almost 22. Two months before that seed comes. My whole point is at times there is a gap that's not up to us. It's not up to my timetable. I wish it was. But it's on God's time. And for whatever reason, his timing is perfect. He's perfect. And he knows what we need before we even ask. Archbishop Oscar Romero speaks on this time frame. He puts it like this. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. There's future promise in the seed or the seeds we sow. But only God can dictate when those promises come to pass. Sometimes it's quick. I've sown, I've seen a quick response. And sometimes there's a delay. There are seeds I've sown that I haven't seen, the reaping of the harvest. I'm not sure. I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime. Maybe another generation will see it. But trust, a harvest will come. When I think of the time of waiting, I think of the mosso bamboo. It's a plant that grows in China, in the Far East, after the mosso is planted, even under perfect conditions, scientists say there's often no significant growth for five years. You can plant that bad boy in the perfect setting and there's no significant growth for five years. And then he said it's almost like magic because after that five-year period, 
that bamboo can grow up to two and a half feet per day and after six weeks can reach up to 90 feet. And they say, though it looks like magic, it's not magic at all. While the bamboo is there for those five years, it says there's a root system developing underground that nobody sees. The roots go deeper and deeper and deeper and then all of a sudden in that six week period, it shoots up 90 feet. And, and listen, from the naked eye, we'll say, whoa, that's magic. Look at those six weeks but we didn't see the five years in the same way in our lives from the naked eye you may experience a time of harvest like never before and people will go whoa the favor of God is on you but they didn't see those five years or those x amount of years where you were you were you were praying and believing God and sowing seeds of faith and sowing seeds of actions sowing seeds of praise sowing seeds of worship to say Lord I'm believing you for this harvest I don't know when that six week sprout up or that supernatural sprout up is going to happen but I do know this as we sow our seeds as we take the time to sow what God has given us I know there's a root system growing deeper within you a, a root system of great faith in the Lord a root system of great expectation in God because you will reap a harvest he said it in his word he will not be mocked My last and final point, we've learned you reap what you sow. We've learned you prepare before you sow. We've learned you reap later than you sow. And lastly, you reap more than you sow. Let me revisit Galatians 6, 9 and 10. It says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. That seed's going to multiply. He says at the proper time, if we do not give up, that means they must have gotten weary. They must have gotten tired. And he's saying, listen, if you don't give up, your seed's going to multiply. He uses that term. You're going you're to see a harvest. You're going to see something sprout up that you didn't expect. Just don't give up. It's going to produce life. It's like that in the natural. You see uh, the little seeds it takes to plant an apple tree, the little seeds it takes to plant a pumpkin, the little seeds it takes to plant whatever. You'll see this sprouting up, and we all get to enjoy the fruit of that sprout up. But listen, listen, there's always going to be more because there's power in that seed that God has given you. It's up to you. And he's made it clear when we sow generously, we'll reap generously. And, and, it, and I love this this phrase we've coined here at Christ Church, it's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. I'm not asking, I don't know what God is tampering your heart with. Nobody's twisting your arm to do anything. All I'm saying is this, would you consider and say, Lord, are you prompting me? Make that your prayer for this week. In fact, if you're going to pray over it this week, put prayer hands right now in the comment section. If you're going to pray over and say, Lord, do you want to use me to sow seed into the work of Christ church specifically here? Do you want to use me? And what are you prompting on my heart to give? And it's not equal giving. It's equal sacrifice to say, God, on December 12th and 13th, I want to sow a seed to believe you for next year's harvest. And I would say, so according to your faith. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear in, in verse 10. And that's why I thought it was important to really harp on that truth. He said, let us do good to all people, especially to the family of believers. Listen, there's one thing to sow to a great cause. I believe in that. That's awesome. Sow to your great cause. But he's saying, listen, there is a place to sow to the family of God. There is a place for sowing towards the work where God has got you planted, where you've been feeding, whether you're a, a, a frequent visitor to our online, whether you've been here for years, there is a place to say, I want to position myself to be a blessing, not to just great humanitarian causes, which are awesome, I want to position myself to be a blessing towards the work of the Lord, specifically here at Christ Church. I 
And then he goes on. And he unpacks that. I, I, I love that this is a model of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is it that what we preach? <laughs> we preach that God gave his only son. And he sows his son, the death of his son, into the ground to rise on a third. Not just, just because he's a masochist and he just wanted to see something bad happen to his son. No, he did it. Why? To reap a family of believers. You and I are part of that family of believers. And if you're not that, I'm going to give you a chance before this sermon is up to be one of the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. I'll close with this. I had a talk with my mother who had been, who's been walking with the Lord for decades upon decades. And I asked her because I've seen her flesh out her faith when it comes to sowing and reaping. And I said, I said, mom, what are your thoughts on sowing and reaping? And how is that manifested in your journey with the Lord? I said, why do you, why do you sow? She said, Lionel, over the years, I've always sown towards the work of the Lord here at Christ Church. Much of her Christian walk's been right here at Christ Church for multiple decades. And she said, I've always sown and I said, why? She said, you know why? Because I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I believe in its power. She added, though, I believe in the work that the Lord is doing here at Christ Church specifically. And I've seen what God has done, and it's encouraged my heart. And then she said, I do believe in a harvest. Though I may have not, when I've sown, I may have not had exactly what I wanted in my mind. I did believe, and I do believe in the harvest. Listen, as her son, growing up in that single parent home, I couldn't help but bring my mind to this. How God's been faithful over the years for the harvest that my mom has reaped along the way. We've had provision. We didn't have all our, all our greeds, but we had all our needs in our household. And then I couldn't help but bring my mind to this. Part of the harvest that she's reaping is me. What do I mean by that? I wasn't walking with the Lord while she was being faithful to the Lord. I was doing my own thing. But she continued to sow into a ministry that God used to bring me to know him and to bring transformation in my life. And I stand before you today as a pastor at this very church that God used. Why? Because I'm a product of my mom's harvest. If you're listening to me right now, you're a product of somebody's harvest that says, I believe in what God is doing in us and through us right now. You and I are products of a harvest. So what we consider to be that same blessing on the 12th and 13th to sow a seed that's going to go towards a harvest for now, yes, you'll reap a harvest in you, but it'll impact generations to come. I want to pray with you. Those that may be under the sound of my voice right now, and you're considering, you're saying, I don't want to miss out on this opportunity to see the law of the harvest operate in my life. I'm going to pray a prayer over you that God will bring seed Four, you'll give you creative ideas on how to gain seed so you can be a sower. And then stay tuned in because I want to pray for you if you don't know Jesus right after. And I want you to know him as Savior. But if that's you, would you posture yourself to receive? And so, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to see the law of the harvest activated in our lives. I ask that each person tuned in, may you tamper with their hearts. May each person be open to that which you want to speak when it comes to a seed they can consider sowing to this ministry. I also ask that you provide creative ideas and creative income streams for them to be able to just sow, but also to live a lifestyle of generosity in their lives and other departments. Open up their mind and their intellectual capacity 
to do exceedingly and abundantly all that they can think or ask or even imagine. I'm thankful for our friends and family of the ministry. May you show yourself faithful over this next week to put something on their heart that they can consider sowing. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I also told you, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I said he gave his life to reap a family. If you want to be part of that family, it's saying, hey, I don't want to do things my way. I'm tired of walking in my own sin and brokenness. I want to pray a prayer with you to reconcile you to Jesus. There's no sin too dark, too far from God to reach. And there's no amount of goodness you can earn in the kingdom of God to earn his love or even earn heaven. The only access point is Jesus. So if you want to know Jesus as Savior, pray this prayer right now silently in your heart where you are right after me or out loud if you feel bold say lord jesus come into my life change me wash away my sins that i may live for you as lord of my life from this day forward it's in christ's name we pray amen Well, congratulations. If you prayed that prayer with me, there's a prompting on the screen. Follow that prompting to get some key materials that will help anchor you in your faith. And don't, remember, don't forget, family, the law of the harvest and all those principles we've learned to see what God wants to do. And I'm excited to hear about the harvest he has for you in your life. Enjoy the rest of your week.